kiss on the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. A kiss may be grand, but it won't pay the rental on your humble flat or help you at the automat. Men grow cold as girls grow old, and we all lose our charms in the end. But square cut or pear shape, these rocks don't lose their shape. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Of course you don't use your charms in the end. You're all charming as you are. Today we're going to talk, as you know, about diamonds. Gorgeous, glittering, beautiful diamonds. All of which you can see in the Smith Gallery. And I hope you take the opportunity to see the magnificent display that Ms. Karakalos and her associates have produced for you. We're going to tell you a few short stories. Beginning with, and they're all famous diamonds, The Mirror of Portugal. They were discovered in the, uh, we think, in the Golconda mines in the south westerly region of present-day India. This particular diamond was about 30 carats in its rough cut shape. 30 carats is a lot of carats, but you haven't gone to the cutter yet. Uh -huh, just you wait. Well. Uh, it was an extremely obscure journey from Golconda to the Portuguese treasury, and we're not going to go through all of that. However, in the 1580s, a man named Don Antonio, known as Prior of Crato, was trying to claim the throne of Portugal. His problem was that he was a bastard. I'm sure you know a lot of people like that. Uh, the issue was that he was the only male descendant of King Emmanuel I of Portugal. Uh, unfortunately, he was born on the bar sinister side of things. So uh, the people opposing that uh, didn't want a, 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 an illegitimate king. And so he was fighting for this. It took years, uh, again, this is, we want to get to the diamonds, uh, of Hugger Mugger for him to sort himself through the problems of trying to obtain his goal. And in one point, or at one point, uh, in the early 80s, 1580s, uh, he went to France. And he took with him all the Portuguese gems from the crown collection. Mm -hmm. And he tried to peddle them on the French monarchy. Actually, he was trying to peddle them on Maria de Medici. Uh, who was uh, soon to be a queen consort of uh, Henry IV. Uh, uh, well, she took an interest. You know, the big problem with uh, Don Antonio's difficulties with Portugal uh, got worse because it was Spain under Philip II who wished to co-opt Portugal into the empire and succeeded eventually, but not at this point. And of course, Don Antonio, this little, this little bastard, uh, was whirling around, and he any minute could be smacked to death by Philip. So he, would, he needed a big helper, big people to help him, and France looked like a good one. Well, the French didn't like the Spanish either, so they gave him a little help. Unfortunately, it resulted in the uh, Ponte Delgado uh, battle between the Spanish and, and the little fleet that uh, Don Antonio could raise, and of course he was uh, not the victor, to say the least. He survived it, uh, but he was always afraid that the assassins of Philip would get him. So he was fleeing hither and yon, and he went to England now. Maybe they'd be helpful. This was under the reign of Elizabeth I. And of course she too, England didn't like the Spanish. Apparently they were not very popular. And, uh, uh, and so she said, all right, she would um, assist him with a fleet, including uh, Admiral Drake, Francis Drake, whom she knew and trusted, 
uh, to uh, attack the Spanish and to try to help and Don Antonio achieve his goal. But she demanded in return possession of a number of these gems, including the Mirror of Portugal. Finally, we get it. You know, it arrived. And uh, well, of course, Don Antonio was carrying the gems for that very purpose, so that was fine. But that too uh, ended in a complete flop. Uh, and uh, Don Antonio went back here. Oh, she was wearing it. There she is on her forehead, uh, the mirror of Portugal set in an enamel setting with pearls and so on. You can see all of this in the Smith. Well, he went back to France uh, to try to uh, recoup some of his gems and sell some more, uh, but he died there in 1595, and he's out of the story. He was a pensioner of Henry IV, but uh, that, that's irrelevant to our story. But the gems were still in England or at least the mayor of Portugal was. And James VI of Scotland has succeeded Elizabeth I, he is now James I of England. And he, of course, had all of the possessions of Elizabeth, including the gems, including mayor of Portugal. Well, eventually in the early 20s, 1620s, uh, James was trying to marry his son, the, the Prince of Wales, let's say, Charles, to uh, a Spanish infanta. You know, even though you don't like the other country, if your children marry, that's supposed to bring everlasting peace and harmony, right? No, uh-huh, you bet. Well, uh, it didn't go too well. Uh, Charles apparently didn't woo the proper people, however, and he came back ca carrying the mirror of Portugal. He wasn't gonna give it up just as a bad deal. No, indeed, the mirror is still possession of the, uh, of the British royals. And a little later on, he married a French princess, the princess royal, Henrietta Maria, who was the sister of the then King of France, Louis XIII. And uh, he gave his wife, here's Henrietta Maria, he gave her the mirror of Portugal, and she had it mounted along his chain and wore it on her bosom as an ornament, and uh, Van Dyke paints her wearing it, so we know that she did do this exactly. Unfortunately, as you historians are well aware, uh, Charles I's politics didn't uh, make him popular in England, and eventually there was a civil war over the issues. Uh, Charles was severely challenged by this, and Henrietta went abroad to uh, Holland to see if she could taking with her the mirror and other gems, uh, raise money and send troops back to help her husband. Well, um, the Civil War was a mess, absolute disaster for the crown, and he was overthrown. Uh, Henrietta had taken the jewels and she was engaging a, a rather attractive duke, the Duke de Epernon, and uh, he was going to sell the gems for her for the purpose of saving her husband. Well, he didn't, he didn't move very quickly because poor Charles was beheaded in 1649 before any troops were ever sent to support him. And that takes uh, Henrietta Marie out of the picture uh, because the Duke still had the jewels. He said, I'm, I'm taking these because of all the effort I put in on your behalf. Ah, well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He, he sold them to uh, Mazarin, Cardinal Mazarin, who was the first minister of Louis XIII. And Mazarin was a great collector of everything beautiful, not necessarily the king, but anyway, everything else beautiful. And here's the gem, it had been recut. Uh, the, uh, many of these owners would have them recut slightly for brilliance, and this happened. And you don't see any much difference. It's done on the uh, pavilion, not on the face. Well, when Mazarin died, he bequeathed all the gems, including the mirror, to young Louis XIV, who was now 20, 21 or something. And uh, he had it recut again. These cuttings are very slight. The jeweler's just, you know, very careful about these things. But it went from 30 carats down to 21, so that's not so slight. It had been cut more than once to get there. Uh, you, you can't see the difference. I can, of course, my trained eye. <laughs> I wouldn't know a diamond from a golf ball if you put it in front of me, but anyway. 
decades pass, ages seem to pass, because now we're in the French Revolution, 1792. Chaos prevails, the Bastille falls, the royals are swept from power, and their gems are conf confiscated by the revolutionaries. And they're put in the, what's, you'll hear this again and again because everybody did the same thing, in the Garde Meuble, which is a great big building that had just been finished on what you now call a Place de la Concorde, but it was then Place de la Revolution. And lo and behold, in the Huggermugger, thieves broke into the back of the building and stole all the jewels, all the gems. Some of them were retrieved, but the mirror of Portugal was lost forever. <gasps> oh. Chapter two. Now we go to the Orloff. Now the Orloff, it wasn't called that in the beginning. It just say it was mined in Golconda again. During the reign of the famous Shah Jahan, a Mughal emperor, and he took possession of it, but he, he, he lost it, sold it, dropped it down the well, I don't know, but it, many people have come to think that the stone that we were discussing at that very early age in the 1650s or 30s, I forget which, 50s I think it was, was the famous Great Mughal. Uh, it was mined from this gold coal to mine, certainly, but this is the cut of the Great Mughal. Now, it was the size of half grapefruit. It was simply colossal. Let's say an orange, I'm exaggerating. Half an orange. Small orange. A Valencia orange. And, and it was up to 808 carats in, in its rough state. And then it was cut down like you see it here. But this is not true. It wasn't part of the Great Mughal. Uh, apparently, uh, it found its way to a Venetian jeweler, and here, here was the rough cut, I mean, the rough stone, not cut. And this is Venice, uh, a man we don't know have his picture, Hortensio Borges, and he was a jeweler, and he reduced it to one very large stone and several very small stones. The largest stone was 276 carats when he was finished cutting it. Now this is the stone that we're talking about. And you can see it in the Smith Gallery. It's absolutely massive. Well, it passed through many hands, fierce and foul, uh, in its history. Before it was acquired, this is a stone cutting uh, establishment in the uh, 16th century. If you're interested in how you cut your stones, you can copy this, get your hammer and tongs. Uh, anyway, it was purchased or acquired by an Armenian a dealer named Grigory Safras. Well, Safras went to Amsterdam to, that was the center of the jewel market out throughout Europe, to uh, peddle his gems. At that time, Catherine the Great had just become empress. This is the 1760s. And she was a collector already. <laughs> I know, she collected those too but we're talking about paintings and gems and statuary and other treasures. Uh, and she had heard of Safras's marvelous collection, so she asked him to come to St. Petersburg, which he did. This is her tidy little house on the Neva River, the Winter Palace, and show her his wares, which he did happily. He could hardly wait. Well, she bought a number of stones from him, and she fancied this huge stone that we've just looked at but it was too expensive. She, if she was going to buy all the others as well, she couldn't afford that one as well. So he took that and the remainder of his collection back to Amsterdam. And the story goes, notice I'm not claiming any authority here, the story goes that Catherine's former lover, Grigory Orloff, now there were several men that helped her to power in 18, 1761, and a couple of them became her lover, Z. And Orloff was one of them, but no longer. She had gone on to something else. Still a good friend, but, you know, not tonight, Henry. And, and so anyway, anyway, he wanted to restore himself to her most intimate side. 
he thought to do this, and he knew about her interest in, in the gems, and he, everybody knew what, what she was up to here as far as collecting. He thought maybe he could buy his way back. So he went to Amsterdam, sought out Saphras and the Great Stone, and invested every single solitary cent he had in buying it so he could take it to Catherine, and then on her name day, he gave it to her. Well, not to say she was pleased, she was really pleased. So pleased, she placed it in her scepter, where it is today. And you can see that in the Smith Gallery. So pleased, yes, she was pleased to a degree. Dear Grigory, we'll never forget all you've done for us. But in place of what you really want, here's a palace. You can have this. And this is his red marble palace on the, uh, right across from the Nietzschekopf there in, uh, in St. Petersburg. I guess you have to settle for less. Oh my. Well, he never got what he wanted, but he was still a great favorite of hers. You can see the Orloff diamond in the scepter today in the great treasure hall in the Kremlin Palace. This is, this is where they keep all the goodies. How many of you have been inside the Kremlin? Somebody must have traveled. You're always traveling. Somebody has. Maybe you've seen the building. Maybe you've seen the treasures because they're open to the public. I don't know the days. But here is uh, just a section where the crowns and the gems and the scepters and the badges and oh my goodness, it goes on and on and on. There are acres of this stuff. Well, uh, the Orlov diamond is one of those fascinating stones. I can tell you more about it some other time, but it certainly figures in, among the greatest of diamonds ever cut. We now go chapter three, to the Beau Sancy. Now this was discovered sometime before 1580. And here's its appearance uncut. Again, uh, you know, if you grab this out of the mud with your grubby hand, you wouldn't see anything but a rock. But, but the people who mine these things, and most of them were slaves then, were trained to spot the good stones, and they did. And they could see, and of course you could wash it off in the muddy water, and pretty soon you had something, you had to hold it up. <laughs> you held that up, or next day you didn't have anything to hold up. So uh, it was discovered. And in 1604, a man named Nicolas de Arlet, Sieur de Saint-Cy, uh, who was serving as ambassador from France to India at the time, uh, acquired it. He purchased it, and he gave it his name. And that's why we call it the Beau Saint-Cy. It was cut. It's, it's, a, it's about so big, and it's a pear-shaped stone. It's the same on both sides. It's very difficult to mount because of that. It doesn't have a flat side or a pavilion on it. Anyway, uh, in 1604, uh, it was sold, I assume by him, to our friend Maria de' Medici who was headed for a coronation, and she placed it in her coronation crown as a finial. You can see that as well in the Smith Gallery. On her coronation day, her consort was Henry IV. He proclaimed her co-ruler because he was going to go off and fight the Spanish. Well, men had to do something. And so off he was going. They had just had their massive coronation, which was uh, memorialized by Rubens. And the next day, as he was leaving town, somebody climbed up on his coach and stabbed Henry to death. So now, she's the widow, Marie de Medici, and left with a little boy. She had other children, but he was the crown prince, the dauphin, heir to the throne. And because he wouldn't be uh, eligible to rule until he was 14 or 15, and he was just, she had to act, or she, she insisted on acting as regent, and the Parlement de Paris sanctioned that. So she became ruler of France, in, in essence, but very unpopular. Uh, soon she was in conflict with the great Richelieu. Richelieu preceded Mazarin, 
Richelieu, Cardinal Richelieu was the primary minister of Louis the Thirteenth, and that's her son, little Louis the Thirteenth. But her um, her policies embroiled France in such uh, extravagance and intrigue that she was devastating the treasury. And young, young Louis's uh, ministers were saying, for God's sake, and Richelieu was constantly saying, sir, you have to get rid of your mother. Retire her to the gables or something, but get her out of the, the, uh, the leadership of the country, which he could. Now he was 16, he was two years late in getting started. And so he, uh, 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 retired her, I guess that's the way, banished her to Comigny. But she didn't stay there long. She escaped and she was carrying with her half the crown jewels. She was no fool. She'd scarf these things up before they'd thrown her out of the country or thrown her out of Paris. And now she went to Brussels. This is Brussels. And she set up housekeeping and she had all her jewels and she lived a very high life including with the Beau Sancy, which she coveted as treasure. And then she moved to Cologne in the German states. She had placed some years before all her affairs in the hands of her beloved and most cherished intimate, Peter Paul Rubens of all people, the famous painter of all that time. And uh, he was apparently a better business manager than she and certainly she had a great deal to offer. She still had influence of a kind, and she had all these jewels, and he painted her a number of times, like this, woo-woo, like that, woo-woo-woo, and like this again, gee whiz. Well, you can imagine her son, the king of France. Oh, mother! Well, they didn't like each other, so. She was out of his reach, and he could just writhe and embarrass. How would you like? Well, how many of you are teenage boys that want your mother naked? <laughs> I wouldn't have minded it with mine. She was a looker. But anyway, <laughs> Marie was spending herself down to poverty, but she wouldn't let go of the Sancy. And when she died in 1642, nearly bankrupt, uh, all her effects were sold up, including the Sancy to pay her debts, you know. Well, uh, the stone found its way to uh, Prince Frederick, Friedrich actually, Friedrich Henry of Orange. He was the stadtholder of Orange in the late 80s, 1680s. He died in 1687 and the stone and other effects, of course, passed to his grandson who became William III, King of England. Now that's a story in and of itself, and those of you familiar with Stuart history in England will know how it worked. But uh, uh, William had been stadtholder, as his great uncle had been, and then the English wanted a change of uh, kings in England and didn't want any more Catholics involved. Uh, so he had married Mary Stuart, who was a thoroughly Protestant princess, daughter of Charles II. And that was his entree to becoming a co-ruler with her in England. They could not rule past their death, obviously. And they, if they had any children, they couldn't rule. It was a life tenure. Well, he married, as I say, Mary Stuart. She was a charming woman. Everybody adored the Queen Mary. She's Queen Mary II, officially. And absolutely lovely woman. And he gave her the Sancy as a gift. And she wore it in various ways in her jewelry. But they both died, eventually he last in 1702, and they had been childless. So the stone went back onto his side, because it had been uh, inherited by the male side. So it went back on the male side, his side, and he didn't have any son, so it went back to a cousin who was Frederick I. Sorry, you're not Frederick I, get out of there. <laughs> Frederick I, who became the king of Prussia. Well, it was a very popular gem in the Prussian crown jewels and other jewelry for many, many years. It was used over and over in different ways, much prized. But in 2012, and there you go, 
Prince Louis Ferdinand of Prussia, he was no longer king of anything, uh, by then the, all these titles have been abolished, but when you once have a family title, you never lose it. It doesn't matter how many Republicans with a small R or, or comrades have anything to do with it. You're still Prince Duke or Baron, whatever it is. I'll say that. Anyway, Prince Louis sold it at auction. And it was sold at Sotheby's in Geneva. And the, uh, uh, the price started at something like a six million. And it was being bid on the phone by an anonymous bidder. There were several anonymous, people do this all the time. If you look at these, if you've ever gone to these places, a bank of phones, people bid from out of the, world, out of the country. Anyway, the bidder kept bidding, 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 up to nine million eight hundred something thousand dollars for this one little stone. And finally sold to Mr. X. Well, it's still there. Somebody's enjoying it every night, putting it in their mouth. That's what you do with a great guy. Isn't that what you do with your diamonds? Oh, look at oh, gorgeous, and trying it on your mistress. Now, take it back, yes, right? Oh, beautiful stones. Well, this is a point where we have a little intermission. When a lass needs a lawyer, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. There may come a time when a hard-boiled employer thinks you're awful nice. But get that ice or else no dice. He's your guy when stocks go high, but beware when they start to descend. It's then that those louses go back to their spouses. Diamonds are a girl.